As shadows lengthen across the backdrop of the early 20th century, an ominous presence emerges from the Far East, the Kempei Tai, the military police of the Imperial Japanese Army. Established in the late 19th century, it evolved into a sinister force by World War II. Under the guise of maintaining order and suppressing dissent, the Kempei Tai unleashed a reign of terror unlike anything the world had ever seen. The interrogation rooms and the secret facilities, including a place of unspeakable horrors known infamously as Unit 731, became the nerve center of this terrifying organization. This, of course, in addition to the brutal interrogations that left prisoners psychologically shattered and physically broken beyond recognition, their evil influence seeping out like dark, poisonous ink, staining the pages of history. But how did this organization operate under the radar to commit such atrocities, and what were the terrifying techniques used by the Kempitai? Can you imagine the creeping terror of a knock on the door, or the cold dread of being taken away to a place where humanity ceases to exist? As echoed by the silent voices of history, a reflection on the Kempei Tai's era in Japan might be expressed by a quotation of the nameless. First, they came for the dissenters, and I did not speak out, because I was not a dissenter. Then they came for the others, and it did not matter as there was no one left to speak, for even those that were alive were no longer human. This poignant sentiment reflects the pervasive fear and suppression under the Kempei Tai's power. Join us as we delve into the heart of darkness that was the Kempi Tai's evil effect on the world. Welcome to the Chronicles of the Raven. Chapter 1. Who were the Kempei Tai of the Japanese Empire? In the land of the rising sun, as Japan's imperial ambitions swelled, a shadow grew ominously, extending its oppressive reach across Asia. The Kempei Tai, initially formed to instill discipline within the ranks of the Imperial Japanese Army, rapidly evolved, expanding its mission scope and becoming an emblem of fear and tyranny across the territories Japan sought to dominate. Japan's empire at its zenith included Korea, Taiwan, parts of China, including Manchuria and numerous Pacific islands. It had significant influence in regions of Southeast Asia and eyed further expansion into the vast territories of Asia, including the resource-rich areas of Southeast Asia and the Pacific. This expansionist policy led to conflicts and conquests, marking the era with the violence of occupation and the imposition of imperial rule. The dawn of the 20th century heralded Japan's emergence as a formidable military power, with the Kempei Tai evolving into one of its most dreaded instruments. Their mission was multifaceted and crystal clear. Ensure total obedience, suppress any form of dissent and maintain the supposed purity and supremacy of the Japanese Empire. They were the enforcers of the state's will, a role they executed with chilling efficiency and unmatched brutality. The Kempei Tai served as the military police force of the Imperial Japanese Army from 1881 until 1945. This organization undertook a dual role, functioning not only as a military entity, but also engaging in civilian tasks such as secret policing, espionage, and counterintelligence, both within Japan and in its occupied regions. Infamous for its harsh methods and its key role in quelling opposition, the Kempitai's responsibilities were wide-ranging. They were charged with upholding military discipline, enforcing conscription legislation, safeguarding crucial military areas, and addressing offenses committed by military service members. In territories under Japanese control, their duties expanded to include the issuance of travel documents, mobilization of labor forces, apprehension of resistance members, acquisition of food and supplies, dissemination of propaganda, and the suppression of anti-Japanese activities. By the close of World War II, the Kempei Tai had grown significantly, boasting a personnel strength of approximately 35,000. The weapons chosen by the Kempei Tai were as varied as they were lethal. From traditional katanas, which were symbolic of their supposed samurai spirit, to modern firearms and even psychological tools of warfare, their arsenal was comprehensive. They were not just equipped to fight, they were equipped to intimidate, to interrogate and to torture. Their presence was often marked by the cold steel of their bayonets or the ominous silence of their pistols, tools that they used with deadly efficiency. But who were these violent law enforcers? 
How did one become a member that would take them down a road of impossible evil? Recruitment into the Kempe Tai was a selective process, drawing from the ranks of the military and those deemed fiercely loyal to the Empire's cause. It required more than just physical prowess, it required a certain ideological zeal and a willingness to carry out orders without moral hesitation. Members were often trained in various forms of combat, espionage and interrogation techniques, making them a formidable force capable of both intelligence gathering and ruthless enforcement. As Japan embarked on its ambitious campaign across Asia, the Kempe Tai was invariably at the forefront, a harbinger of the oppression to follow. They ensured that territories fell in line through a systematic mix of intimidation, pervasive surveillance and outright brutality. Their presence was not just a military strategy, it was a psychological campaign, signaling that the Japanese Empire would tolerate no dissent. In Korea, China and throughout Southeast Asia, the Kempe Tai enforced policies with an iron fist, extracting resources, suppressing local customs and brutally dismantling any form of resistance. They would reshape societies, attempting to erase cultural identities and replace them with imposed ideologies that served the Empire's interests. Their methods were meticulously sinister and chillingly effective. Interrogation techniques, which would later reach their terrifying zenith with the advent of Unit 731, an evil you cannot begin to imagine that we will uncover later in this documentary, began with more conventional forms of torture. Beatings, bone-breaking, water torture and psychological manipulation were commonplace in their cruel repertoire. Victims might be subjected to the infamous water cure, where water would be forced into the prisoner's stomach via the nose or mouth until they swelled, followed by beatings to inflict severe pain. Or they would employ hojojutsu, a method that used extreme psychological manipulation to break down the individual's mental resistance through tying prisoners in painful positions for hours or days, both as a means of punishment and as a way to extract information. Those suspected of being enemies of the state, or even those rumored to have divergent thoughts, were subjected to relentless pursuit and punishment. The mere mention of the Kempi Tai was enough to silence the most outspoken critic and quell potential dissent. The fear of their retribution was a dark cloud over occupied territories and within Japan itself. But the reach of the Kempitai was not limited to the battlefield or the occupied territories. It extended deeply into the lives of Japanese citizens and those of its vast empire. A pervasive network of informants and a culture of fear ensured that resistance was not only perilous, but often futile. The Kempitai's authority was absolute, their presence ubiquitous casting a long, ominous shadow over the daily lives of millions. In the occupied territories, the Kempeitai's reputation was the stuff of nightmares. They set up headquarters in major cities, converting prominent buildings into symbols of dread. The mere sight of these buildings would send a shiver down the spine of locals. These were places of unspeakable acts, where the walls echoed with the screams of the tortured, and the air was thick with the despair of the doomed. They were often the last places many would see alive, as they were either executed or left to die after severe torture. The Kempeitai's enforcement of wartime mobilization, labor, and resource extraction policies was draconian. They oversaw the conscription of comfort women from occupied territories, a horrific euphemism for the systematic sexual slavery imposed on these women. Who were these women and how they were treated will be explored in the subsequent section. The Kempe Tai ensured that any resources, from rice to metal, were ruthlessly funneled back to support Japan's war machine. Those who resisted, or even those who failed to meet quotas, perhaps due to illness or incapacity, were met with harsh, often fatal punishment. The message was clear. The needs of the empire superseded the value of individual lives. As we delve deeper, we continue to uncover the layers of this organization, revealing a complex system designed for maximum control and efficiency. From their role in enforcing wartime policies to their deep involvement in some of the most chilling episodes of the war, the Kempe Tai left a mark that is indelible and horrifying. Looming in the background of all these atrocities 
is the spectre of Unit 731, a name that symbolizes the darkest aspects of human experimentation and the depths of cruelty one can inflict in the name of science and war. As this narrative unfolds, we are forced to confront uncomfortable truths about human nature and the capacity for evil. Chapter 2. The Kempe Tai Enforcers of Terror Notorious Leaders Viewer discretion is advised for the rest of this video, as some of it may be offensive or disturbing, and is why this video was made, to expose the truth of these atrocities. Kenji Doihara, a major general and intelligence officer in the Imperial Japanese Army, wielded significant influence in espionage and subversive activities in China. His orchestrating role in the Mukden incident, a false flag event staged by Japanese military personnel, precipitated the 1931 Japanese invasion of Manchuria, marking a pivotal escalation in Japan's aggressive expansion. Doihara's actions extended beyond military strategies. He was notoriously involved in opium trafficking, using it as a means to finance intelligence operations. This involvement had dire societal impacts, exacerbating addiction and social disruption within China. His mastery of psychological warfare and intelligence led to effective but devastating campaigns against both military targets and civilian populations. Doihara's legacy is one marred by manipulation, contributing significantly to the suffering and instability in the region during this tumultuous period. Masaharu Homa As the commander of the Japanese forces in the Philippines from 1941 to 1942, General Masaharu Homa held direct command over military operations, including the brutalities executed by the Kempe Tai. Homa's most infamous atrocity was the Batan Death March, where thousands of Filipino and American POWs perished under his watch due to starvation, abuse, and execution. His military leadership, marked by a callous disregard for human life, epitomized the cruelty of the Japanese occupation in the Philippines. The Death March remains one of the darkest episodes of the war in the Pacific, a testament to Homer's ruthless efficiency in implementing military objectives at the expense of basic humanitarian principles. The march occurred after the three-month Battle of Bataan, part of Japan's campaign to conquer the Philippines, a strategic location in the Pacific. The battle ended with the surrender of approximately 75,000 Filipino and American troops on April 9, 1942, which was the largest ever surrender of American-led forces in history. The prisoners were forced to march approximately 65 miles from Mariveles Bataan to San Fernando, Pampanga, and then onward to Camp O'Donnell, a prisoner of war camp. The march took place under brutal conditions, including intense heat, lack of water and food, physical abuse, and violence from the Japanese soldiers. It is estimated that thousands of POWs died during the march due to starvation, dehydration, disease, and outright execution. Survivors reported horrific conditions, including beatings, shootings, bayonet stabbings, and beheadings for those who fell behind or were unable to continue. Seishiro Itagaki, serving as both a minister of war and a general, had a profound impact on military decisions affecting occupied territories during the 1930s and 1940s. He played a pivotal role in Japan's 1937 invasion of China and the establishment of Manchukuo, a puppet state used as a platform for Japanese expansion. Itagaki's actions were characterized by widespread atrocities, including severe exploitation of the local populace and the implementation of oppressive policies. His military strategies and political maneuvers significantly contributed to the suffering and turmoil experienced in the region. As a key figure in the Japanese military leadership, Itagaki's legacy is indelibly marked by his contribution to the aggressive and often brutal expansion of the Japanese Empire. Koichi Kido, as Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal of Japan from 1940 to 1945, was one of Emperor Hirohito's closest advisors, wielding substantial influence over Japan's military and governmental policies during a crucial period in its history. Kido's involvement in decision-making processes led to numerous wartime atrocities. He played a critical role in maintaining the war effort and was instrumental in shaping the policies that guided Japan's military actions. Kido's influence extended beyond mere advisory capacities, 
as he was deeply involved in the strategic planning and execution of Japan's war strategies, making him a key figure in the nation's wartime leadership and its subsequent consequences. Nobusuke Kishi's role as a bureaucrat in Manchukuo during the 1930s and early 1940s placed him at the forefront of economic and industrial policymaking in the puppet state. His influence was pivotal in the severe exploitation of Chinese labor and resources. Kishi implemented policies that led to harsh working conditions and suffering for countless individuals. His actions significantly contributed to the oppressive environment in Manchukuo reflecting the broader imperialistic ambitions of Japan. Kishi's career, marked by his involvement in these exploitative practices, later transitioned into post-war politics, showcasing a complex legacy intertwined with both the darker aspects of Japan's wartime actions and its post-war recovery. General Tomoyuki Yamashita, known as the Tiger of Malaya, commanded military operations in Southeast Asia during World War II particularly from 1941 to 1942. His military campaign in Malaya and Singapore was characterized by the Malaya Massacre, involving massacres and severe treatment of civilians and POWs. Yamashita's strategies, though militarily successful, were marked by a brutal approach to warfare, leading to numerous atrocities under his command. His actions in these campaigns were emblematic of the broader ruthlessness of the Japanese military during its expansion, leaving a lasting impact on the regions he controlled. Yamashita's legacy remains controversial, encapsulating the complexities of military leadership in times of aggressive expansion and conflict. This is just a sample of the faces you dare not see while living your daily lives, but behind the visage of conquest lay a true evil, and one of the most vile was Shiro Ishii leader of Unit 731, but before that we must consider the following. The vile nature of mankind. The Kempe Tai's approach to POWs was characterized by systemic brutality and a complete disregard for international norms and human rights. The POWs were subjected to various forms of physical and psychological torture. Common methods included waterboarding, where prisoners were forced to ingest water to the point of drowning electric shocks, severe beatings, and the use of stress positions. The Kempi Tai also employed bamboo torture, where bamboo shoots were inserted under the fingernails. Sleep deprivation and solitary confinement were common, along with mock executions designed to instill acute fear. The camps, often overcrowded and lacking basic sanitation, led to the rapid spread of diseases. Medical care was virtually non-existent, leading to a high mortality rate. Food and water were scarce, and what was provided was grossly inadequate, resulting in malnutrition and starvation. A notorious example is the handling of the American and Filipino POWs during the Bataan Death March mentioned before. Another example is the construction of the Burma Railway, where POWs were forced into labor under appalling conditions, leading to thousands of deaths. The Kempe Tai's operations were marked by a strategy of instilling fear through mass executions and public torture. Their methods were designed to break the spirit of resistance and enforce submission. Those arrested by the Kempe Tai were presumed guilty and had little option of receiving civilian help and no chance to appeal for clemency. The Kempe Tai officer was police investigator, prosecutor, judge, jury and executioner. Often long quiet sessions of interrogation would be used lasting until the officer received the desired answers. If these were not forthcoming, the officer would use various brutal methods to extract a confession. Tortures to the limit of human endurance or to the point of death were administered. These various torture methods were attested to by survivors. They ranged from corporal beatings, water torture, electric shock torture, resorting to burning and mutilation of flesh with cigarette butts, cheroot ends, petrol and methylated spirits on sensitive parts of the body from armpits to genitalia. Dislocation of limbs were coming place along with mock assassinations in order to inflict more psychological torture. These acts of violence were not only directed at soldiers or resistance fighters, but also at civilians, including women and children. The psychological impact on the communities was profound, creating an atmosphere of constant fear and helplessness.
One of the most infamous incidents involving the Kempei Tai was the Nanjing Massacre in 1937, where they played a significant role in the atrocities committed against the Chinese population. The massacre saw mass killings, widespread sexual violence and looting, leaving a deep scar in the history of the region. It stands as one of the most horrific atrocities of the 20th century, a stark illustration of the depths of human cruelty during wartime. Occurring over six weeks from December 1937 to January 1938, this event encapsulates the brutal nature of the Imperial Japanese Army, including the notorious Kempei Tai during their invasion of China. The massacre occurred during the early stages of the Second Sino-Japanese War, a conflict fueled by Japan's imperialistic ambitions in China. The Japanese military sought to establish dominance in East Asia, with China being a primary target due to its resources and strategic position. Nanjing, then the capital of nationalist China, was a symbolic and strategic target for the Japanese forces. The decision to capture Nanjing was part of a broader strategy to break the spirit of Chinese resistance. As the Japanese army entered Nanjing, they began an indiscriminate onslaught against the city and its inhabitants. Soldiers were given free reign to loot, burn, and kill. The violence was not just a byproduct of war, but a deliberate strategy of terror. The scale of the atrocities was staggering. Estimates suggest that up to 200,000 people were killed, victims included civilians and disarmed soldiers. The methods of killing were barbaric, often involving beheading, bayoneting, and live burials. The massacre also involved widespread sexual violence. The Kempei Tai, among other Japanese military units, actively participated in organizing mass sexual violence and sexual slavery with no regard to age, furthering the horror inflicted upon the population. The brutality exhibited in Nanjing was part of a broader strategy by the Kempei Tai and the Japanese military to instill fear and suppress resistance. The massacre was intended to serve as a warning to other Chinese cities about the consequences of resistance. These absolutely vile behaviors had a purpose, to control. The context of this control varied, and these methods were used in a variety of scenarios we'll explore now. The comfort women's system, organized and maintained by the Kempi Tai, is one of the most egregious examples of wartime sexual violence. Tens of thousands of women, mainly from Korea and China, were forced into sexual slavery in military brothels. The Kempei Tai established and managed comfort stations where women, many of whom were abducted or deceived into service, were forced to have sexual relations with Japanese soldiers. The system was widespread, encompassing territories across Southeast Asia and the Pacific, and were often kept in conditions akin to slavery. Many of the women were young girls, and the trauma they endured had lasting physical and psychological effects. The scale of this system was massive, with an estimated tens of thousands of women affected. Personal testimonies from survivors have shed light on the harrowing experiences and the lasting impact on their lives. These testimonies are a poignant reminder of the physical and emotional brutality inflicted upon them during World War II. At the age of 89, Lee Ok Sun recounted her inability to bear children due to the diseases she contracted while being forced into sexual slavery. Her testimony highlighted not only the immediate physical abuse, but also the long-term health consequences that haunted her for life. I couldn't get pregnant. I couldn't even think about having a baby. I got diseases which impacted my ability to have children. A survivor from the Philippines, Lola Maxima's story was not just told in words, but also expressed through her body language. She acted out her experiences, vividly portraying the horror she endured through clawing, screaming, and falling onto the floor in front of her daughter, who was hearing her mother's story for the first time. At the age of 79 in 2005, Lola Pilar recounted the nightly horrors she faced. Five men a night violated me. The soldiers alternated, so there were different men each night. If I refused, they'd slap and hit me. Her testimony sheds light on the relentless and systematic nature of the abuse. Some survivors, during their interviews, physically demonstrated the trauma inflicted upon their bodies. They showed scars and injuries, pointing to areas where they had been beaten or violated, revealing the indelible physical marks left by their abusers. The stigma attached to their experiences often led to decades of silence, 
In August 1991, Kim Hak-soon became the first South Korean woman to publicly speak about her experiences as a sexual slave for the Japanese military. Her bravery in breaking over 50 years of silence paved the way for other survivors across Asia to share their stories. These testimonies not only document the atrocities committed, but also serve as a call for acknowledgement, justice, and remembrance. The Kempe Tai used a combination of espionage, infiltration, and brutal force to break up resistance groups. They conducted raids, mass arrests, and executed suspected members of the resistance. The Kempe Tai's involvement in forced labor and exploitation of civilians in occupied territories was a crucial element of Japan's war effort. Civilians were coerced into working under appalling conditions, contributing to Japan's military and industrial needs. Laborers were subjected to long working hours, minimal food and brutal treatment. The Death Railway, formerly known as the Burma Railway, is a historical symbol of the brutal conditions of forced labor during World War II. Built by the Empire of Japan to support its forces in the Burma campaign, this railway was constructed using prisoners of war and Asian laborers who were coerced or forcibly recruited. The railway was intended to connect Banpong, Thailand, with Thambuzayat, Burma, now Myanmar, providing a supply route to support Japanese military operations. The route was seen as a strategic alternative to sea transport, which was vulnerable to Allied attacks. Over 180,000 Asian civilian laborers and 60,000 Allied POWs were forced to work on the railway. The, the construction of the railway was characterized by extreme conditions. Workers suffered from malnutrition, diseases, and a lack of medical facilities. The harsh work environment, coupled with cruel treatment by the Japanese Imperial Army and the Kempei Tai, led to high death rates. It is estimated that around 90,000 Asian laborers and 12,000 POWs died during the construction of the railway. Deaths were caused by starvation, overwork, disease, particularly cholera, dysentery and malaria, and brutal beatings. One of the most notorious sections of the railway was Hellfire Pass, a deep cutting through rock made by POWs using only hand tools. The name derives from the hellish fires used at night to illuminate the work, casting eerie shadows on the emaciated workers. The Kempei Tai's efforts to suppress local cultures and indoctrinate the populations in occupied territories were part of Japan's broader strategy to assimilate these regions into the empire. The Kempei Tai enforced policies that banned local customs, languages and religious practices. They sought to replace these with Japanese cultural elements, promoting Shintoism and the Japanese language. Schools and educational institutions were targeted for indoctrination, textbooks were revised to reflect Japanese imperial ideology, and teachers were compelled to follow strict curriculums that glorified Japan and its military exploits. These policies led to the erosion of cultural identities in occupied territories. The younger generation in particular was heavily influenced by this indoctrination, leading to long-term impacts on cultural heritage. The Kempei Tai's role in cultural suppression and indoctrination was a significant aspect of Japan's imperialistic policies, aiming to reshape societies according to Japanese values and beliefs. Chapter 4. The Ultimate Evil Unit 731, a covert biological and chemical warfare research unit of the Imperial Japanese Army, stands as a ghastly symbol of wartime atrocities committed under the guise of scientific research. This unit, led by Lieutenant General Shiro Ishii, operated primarily during the Second Sino-Japanese War and World War II, leaving behind a legacy of horror and death. The origins of Unit 731 trace back to the early 1930s, initially conceptualized as a research facility focused on preventing and treating epidemic diseases it took a sinister turn under the leadership of Shiro Ishii. Officially established in 1936 in Harbin, China, Unit 731 was disguised as the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department. Its true purpose was far from benign, aimed at developing biological and chemical weapons for Japan's military expansion. Over the years, the unit expanded into a vast complex with over 150 buildings in Pingfang, near Harbin, encompassing laboratories, prisons, and testing grounds, 
Unit 731's experiments on human beings, carried out during the 1930s and 1940s, were some of the most horrific acts of the Second Sino-Japanese War and World War II. Under the guise of research, prisoners of war and civilians became subjects in ghastly experiments. The unit used thousands of individuals, including Chinese civilians, anti-Japanese partisans, political prisoners, and even allied POWs. These subjects were dehumanized, referred to as maruta or logs, to conceal the true nature of the experiments. Vivisections were performed without any form of anesthesia to study the effects of various diseases and injuries on the human body. This often involved dissecting live subjects to examine the effects of bacterial infections or the results of battlefield injuries. Researchers conducted amputations to study blood loss and the effects of gangrene. Prisoners were infected with diseases like plague, anthrax, cholera, and syphilis. The purpose was twofold, to observe the progression of these diseases and to develop effective biological warfare agents. Researchers monitored the symptoms and deterioration of the victim's health without providing any treatment. Experiments were conducted to determine the limits of the human body. Subjects were subjected to extreme temperatures to study the effects of frostbite. Some were placed in pressure chambers to see how much the human body could withstand before collapsing. The researchers at Unit 731 were also focused on weaponizing the pathogens they studied. This included developing methods of mass-producing diseases like anthrax and plague. They tested various delivery methods for these pathogens, including bombs and sprayers over Chinese villages. The experiments conducted by Unit 731 were not only acts of extreme cruelty, but also had significant implications for the development of biological warfare. The unit's activities, hidden under the pretext of medical research, represented a gross violation of human rights and ethical standards in medical science. Unit 731 developed numerous forms of biological weapons, including plague-infected fleas and pathogens like anthrax and cholera. These were engineered for use in warfare against enemy populations. The unit worked on ways to effectively spread these diseases, including through contaminated water supplies and food. The unit conducted numerous field tests of these biological weapons. One infamous method was the dropping of ceramic bombs filled with plague-infected fleas over Chinese cities. These actions resulted in several outbreaks of plague, causing a high number of civilian casualties and widespread panic. The use of these biological weapons had devastating effects on the civilian populations in the targeted areas. The indiscriminate nature of the attacks led to large-scale public health crises, overwhelming the already strained medical infrastructure. The unit's actions demonstrated a flagrant disregard for human life in the pursuit of military objectives, but most for an absolute sinister general curiosity. The scale and impact of Unit 731's activities extended far beyond their immediate location in Pingfang and had profound implications on both a regional and global scale. Unit 731's operations were extensive, with thousands of victims subjected to experiments. The vast complex in Pingfang was the epicenter of these activities, housing numerous laboratories, testing facilities and prisons. This allowed for large-scale experimentation and the development of biological warfare techniques. It contributed to the advancement of biological warfare globally. The data collected by the unit, though obtained through inhumane methods, was of interest to other nations, including the United States, which led to the controversial granting of immunity to key figures in Unit 731. You heard that correctly. Lieutenant General Shiro Ishii, the leader of the unit, was granted full immunity in exchange for the data they had gathered from human experimentation with the United States. Reasons for this will be explored in an upcoming video. Due to this post-war, the activities of Unit 731 were largely shrouded in secrecy. The full extent of their atrocities was not immediately known to the world. Over time, however, the truth began to emerge, leading to international condemnation and a re-examination of ethical standards in warfare and medical research. The legacy of Unit 731 is one of horror and inhumanity, it stands as a stark reminder of the atrocities that can be committed in the name of scientific progress and the importance of ethical constraints in both science and military actions. Memorials and museums have been established to remember the victims and educate future generations 
about these dark chapters in history. Evil Legacies The aftermath of Unit 731's atrocities presents a troubling narrative of evasion of justice and the complexities of historical acknowledgement. Following Japan's surrender in 1945, the actions and consequences of Unit 731 entered a controversial phase, marked by a lack of accountability for its leaders and a muted response by subsequent Japanese governments. It is important to understand that Unit 731 has multiple adjacent units in different locations, on smaller scales such Unit 1644 in Nanjing or Unit 9420 in Singapore that focused on diseases and pathogens in biological warfare. A lot of the same evil that hitherto had been unseen in history was also conducted in these units. As the war concluded, Unit 731's facilities in Pingfang were ordered to be destroyed by Lieutenant General Shiro Ishii to conceal evidence of the atrocities committed. In a move that remains contentious, American forces granted immunity to Shiro Ishii and other key figures of Unit 731 in exchange for the data from their biological and chemical experiments. This immunity deal, driven by the United States' interest in the research for its biological warfare program during the Cold War, allowed perpetrators of heinous crimes to evade justice. Unlike many Nazi war criminals who faced justice at the Nuremberg trials, the architects and participants of Unit 731 were not subjected to similar war crime tribunals. This lack of accountability allowed many involved in Unit 731 to resume civilian life without facing repercussions for their actions. However, the, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, also known as the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal, was a military trial convened after World War II to try Japanese leaders for war crimes. In November 1948, the tribunal delivered its judgments. Seven defendants, including Tojo, were sentenced to death by hanging. Others received life sentences or long prison terms. For decades, the Japanese government maintained silence over the activities of Unit 731, neither confirming nor denying the atrocities. This lack of acknowledgement contributed to a significant gap in the historical understanding and recognition of these war crimes. The secrecy surrounding Unit 731 meant that awareness of its atrocities was limited both within Japan and internationally. It wasn't until the 1980s and 1990s that the issue began receiving significant public and media attention, leading to demands for acknowledgement and accountability. Many leaders of the Kempitai, responsible for overseeing and executing these brutal policies, also evaded justice. The Kempe Tai, alongside Unit 731, symbolizes one of the most diabolic chapters in human history. Their legacy, characterized by a chilling disregard for human life and dignity, stands as a testament to the depths of cruelty and barbarism that can arise in times of war. The story of the Kempe Tai and Unit 731 is not just a historical account, it is a cautionary tale about the moral abyss that can engulf societies during wartime. It underscores the need for vigilance, ethical standards and accountability to prevent such atrocities from happening again. As we remember the victims and acknowledge the pain inflicted, it is imperative that we learn from these dark chapters of history and commit to upholding the principles of humanity, justice and peace.